to do that, what I'll do is go to Programs. I'll go to the Autodesk folder. And you'll find Ecotect Analysis. I'm going to go to the 2010 version. It's loaded on just about every machine in here. There's one or two machines that it's not quite not on your machine. I'll apologize. We can load it on your machine pretty quickly. Or we can have you move to a different machine. It just takes a few minutes to do so. See if you have um, Ecotect Analysis. If you don't, we'll try and get you set up in terms of having it. It looks like this. We have this drawing environment that's just waiting for a building to be. Oh, similar but just different enough from Revit to be confusing about how you navigate around in here. And that's one of the problems as you get these different tools is that you think you recognize all the tools, but you don't. They're just kind of a little bit different. And when we say import, we can import some model or analysis data. I'll go on out there to where I've put that. And if I go out to session 16 and get 3A, oops, I'm not seeing anything. The reason being, I have to choose the right file format type, and it's an XML file. And then you'll see it. So watch out for that one. If you come here and you can't find it, remember to go back through the file filter. Make sure you're looking for XML files. Otherwise, you won't find it. Say OK, and we're ready to go. Okay, over here, what has happened is Space 1 and Space 2 have come through as Office and Lab. We at least have a hunch that we're in the heading in the right direction because those names look familiar to us. We can take a look at the XML nodes. But, oh, that looks like that XML. We're not going to be very interested in looking at that but to all the surface definitions. Okay. We can just go ahead and bring this file in but let me actually recommend doing something just a little bit different before we go there. As you go through, it recognizes that the roof is probably a floor. It's recognizing assigning materials to those different. So if we want to go through and do a little mapping between our Revit material assemblies and some assemblies that are set up in here, it's good to go ahead and put that together, just do the mapping right now. And how that looks is as follows. We can go ahead and for the basic wall, generic A, we can select an existing material. Let me go shifting over to some wall materials. Okay, These names are a little bit strange. We should probably change these to match things that look more familiar. But if I wanted to have oh, a stud wall, Okay, that had stucco on the outside. In their language, that's a framed timber plaster wall. Okay, this is all done in the UK, so the language is a little bit different. But we can go ahead and choose that wall type. Okay. We'll take a look at all the properties of those walls in just a second. For the windows, here's this fixed window, 36 by 48. Let me go ahead and I'll choose a window type for that. Set it as a window, but I'll choose one of the existing window types. Under the window types, we have the whole idea, is it a single glazed window, a double glazed window, we have an aluminum frame or a wooden frame. Let me go ahead and I'm just going to do that as a single glazed aluminum frame window, which is, you're going to find out, not a very efficient window, but it's going to be a good starting point. Okay, for the roof, let me go ahead and take a look what's over there. Looks like for the roof, it's going to start out just being a metal deck. That doesn't sound very good. Let me go ahead and get at least the metal deck insulated. An uninsulated roof sounds like a very bad thing in terms of trying to keep the heat in. The floor, we can choose a material there. Let me go through and choose a floor material of like slab on grade, concrete slab on ground. The door. Let's see what's going on there. For doors, oh, let's do a solid door that's made of maybe oak. And for the curtain wall, let's go ahead and this is going to be interesting. Got these two different choices there. They worry me a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and set them to single aluminum glazed. Uh, a 
little bit worried about whether those are actually both window types. It's guessing they're both window types. And then I'll finally say, for the last one there, system panel glazed, I'll change that too. Uh, okay. Single glazed, double, single glazed aluminum. There we go. Now, having gone through that work, that was kind of a lot of work going through and mapping those together. Go ahead and do this. So we don't have to do that every time we keep on iterating around. Let's save those material mappings away so we can get them back again really easily. Sounds like a good idea to me. So save, I'll say class three material mappings. Okay. Let's just hang on to those because I don't want to have to go back and change those all again. Say OK. I'll go ahead and now we'll open this as a new model. Bring it up and you will see here is our building on the side about 20 degrees oriented from north south there's a little north arrow over here okay it looks like through these are the simplified surfaces that have come on through if you go clicking on something like if i click on that you'll see that it's actually a window there's that single glazed window aluminum frame it's because what we mapped it to single glazed window aluminum frame if i click on this wall you'll see it's a frame timber plaster wall that big old thing there, that's our curtain wall. That's the one that worries me. I think that one may need to be a wall. We'll figure that out. If I get an error, that's what it probably is. Okay. Notice also you're seeing different colors. There's colors, it's kind of a lighter brown color and kind of a darker color. Those are the different zones, those rooms that came on in each having different, slightly different thermal properties. Okay, we brought the model in there. Let's start with this. Before we go through any further, let's make sure that you can set up the way you like. And one of the things that's actually really important to you to have an intuitive understanding is set it up so that it's using either US units or SI units or whatever it is you're familiar with. Okay, so. If you're used to working in SI units, switch it that way. If you're used to working in US units, switch it that way. But make sure the units are something that's going to be familiar to you, because if things are showing up in a completely foreign system, you won't have a very good sense of how they should be. Okay, so SI units or US standard. I work in US standard, because that's familiar to me. I'll say apply it to all my sessions, so I can kind of keep on working with that for every session, as opposed to on reapplying this. But one thing that's very, very confusing to me is when I travel around the world, especially I have a, I have a real time with trouble with temperatures. I don't know what it is. The you know, if you can give me a degree in degree Celsius, and I have a very hard time revealing that to what, what it should be like Fahrenheit. You know, it's just, it's, it's just I wasn't raised that way, so it's like it's a. Uh, I have to kind of think about it hard every time. So make your units be familiar the way you like them. I'll apply that to all sessions. Sure. Okay. We got our units set up. We looked a little about, we did some mapping of materials to each surface. We could actually take a look at the materials themselves and actually think about what their transmittance properties are and customize it a little bit. Oh, sort of the pulse. Let me go ahead and talk a little bit about the thermal properties just so you have a sense of what we're up to and then later we can go ahead and start customizing to be what we want to be. Okay. The idea is there are really two ways of talking about how heat flows through going through things. We have something like an R value, which is the way we tend to describe walls here in the United States. R is like thermal Okay. There's also a U value. U value is thermal conductance. And the truth is, they're very simply related, just like vice versa. Okay. So if I give you an R value, you can compute U value, you can go back and compute the R. About walls, we'll tend to talk about things as oh, that's an R13 wall, and what we mean is that there's R13 insulation. In it. There's some other materials around it, but we're talking about the layers of insulation and how much resistivity there is to heat transfer. And let me give you some guidance about how to think about that. There's a handout kind of hanging around out there on the coursework website that's R value, and it's really based on this notion that you have an. And then you're going to put some material between that's going to slow down the flow of heat between that difference in temperatures. 
when we talk about the R value of a wall, this is the R19. That's only rated as it has some conductance. The gypsum drywall has a rating of about 0.4. A rating of about 0.6. A rating of about 0.4. Altogether, the total assembly is in R20. Okay. Now, if you have moved into a house in the Stanford 1970 or so, it may be very, very clear now. And the reason is a lot of the houses that were built before the 70s with no insulation in them. It's like, why is it nice here? It's only cold three nights a year. Why would you need insulation here? You know, we sort of went through and lied to ourselves and said that you really didn't need insulation. And the difference is, if you have that insulation, you see the total value you have is less than 2 as compared to 20. What does that mean? In terms of the amount of heat flowing through those walls, it really is the relationship of 2 to 20. 10 times as much heat is flowing through your walls as is flowing through my walls. Okay, so. If you're in a house that in a house that is uninsulated, you know you're losing an awful lot of heat to those. Go back in. Flow of heat. So when we think about R values for walls, we're often talking about R13 walls, R19 walls, and if you go through and you do this relationship, U equals one over R, you'll come up with. Uh, Wall. What's 1 over 13? Anyone have a calculator handy on them? I'm flipping around on my phone here, see if I can find one. Okay, 1 divided by 13. What, 0 0.076, something like that? What are next? I'm going to be able to guess. That's going to be 0 0.05 or something like that, right? How much is it? Around there. Okay, no worries. So those are the U values. Resistance, U is the amount of transfer. Let's talk about windows. Okay, windows tend to have R values that are very, very different. In terms of transmittance of a window, windows can as, oh, for a single pane window or something like that, it might actually be as high as like 0.8 or something like that. A pretty good window that you and I can buy today, if I buy a fairly well insulated window, nice double pane window, is going to be, oh, somewhere around like 0.33, something like that. Okay, as the U value, if I translate that back to an R value, it has an R value of around 3. Okay, so windows definitely do lose a whole lot more heat than the walls do. We're starting to have some really fantastic windows become available now where the R values are actually getting close to some walls. And that's pretty incredible that you can actually do something like that. And to invest in those windows, if I'm the owner of the building, if I can go ahead and invest you know, even 30, 40% more in that window, okay, if I'm going to live with the building for the next 50 years, I might recover that money very, very easily. I could do an economic. Part of the problem we have today is that since so many buildings are being built by developers who will turn over the building very rapidly to someone else who will own it, is they'll put the cheaper window in, cover the savings later. So we end up with a lot, a lot of things that are built really not to the highest standards that are available because you know it's really it's the issue of really who's going to benefit. You know, the person who's going to operate the building has a different incentive from the person who's building it and selling it. Okay, and you have to watch out for that because you have to remember who it is and what's going to be appealing to them. Okay, let's go on back over here to Ecotect and just think about where this factors in. Each of these different walls, for example, this framed timber plaster wall, if I take a look at it, has some properties associated with it. And it has a U value associated with it of 0.38. Okay, that really. You know, it doesn't look like it's even insulated right now. Okay, that doesn't sound very good at all in terms of 0.38. It looks like it's a frame wall. Let's even take a look at the layers. Well, couldn't find the whole library file. It's got an air, got, got plasterboard. Looks like it doesn't even have any insulation in there. Okay, 
I could go through and try and add an insulation layer in there. We'll try that next time. But I'm just going to go ahead and create a new material that has a value closer to what I know it should be. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go say that it's an R13 insulated wall. I'm going to go through and give it its value for an R13 wall, which would be 0.076. I'll give it also the value as the admittance. And I will say, add that new element to our library over here. So you'll see R13 insulated wall over there. Super. So I can adjust these materials if I want to. And I can take a look at any of the different materials for the windows and just really start adjusting the U values. Okay. Now, this is still a set of frame timber plaster. So what I can do is as follows. What I want to do is actually, I could just select the material for that one object. What I'm actually going to do is say, select all the matching objects. That'll grab all the walls that have that right now, so I can change them all at once. I'm going to have to click out of here. I really hate this about this menu system. But if I click back in, now I can say select material. I can use my better insulated wall. Okay, And now you'll see that all those walls are using my better insulated wall value instead. So I've set up some thermal properties for my walls. So you can kind of keep on adjusting those and tweaking those, trying out different materials and different layering. Okay. One of the last things we're going to do in preparation for analysis, though, is as follows. We're not only concerned about the envelope and sort of how the sun is hitting us and the outside going through there. In this building. We not only sort of have heat coming from and the temperature difference to worry about. We have this notion of the fact that we're sitting in here, heat, the fact that there are 30 of us in here is generating a lot of heat, the fact there are 30 computers and screens, plus the There's a lot of heat emanating out from this, that all these different things are adding heat to the room, and we would like to go ahead and factor that in too. Now, we're not all in here 24 hours during so we really would like to think about that we're sort of here from 8 in the morning till 10 at night. Okay, and then on weekends, well, we're not heating the building at night, so we can't really sort of add it in at that time. So we have to kind of factor that in. Oh, what's the last thing we have to think about? We have to think about the whole HVAC system and really are we doing anything about that? Because if we have no system that's going to do the heating and ventilation conditioning, we'll generate a lot of heat, that's fine. Eventually, that heat will dissipate. The building will cool back down. But if we put a heating and ventilating and air conditioning system in here, what will happen is we'll say, OK, if this building gets just so cold at night, I'm going to heat, and I'm going to conserve energy going to heating the building up to a comfortable level at night. OK, same thing when it's warm in here, it's a level to what we consider to be acceptable, the air conditioning will kick in. And then we'll be expending energy trying to keep the temperature down low. To where we want it. So all these things have to get factored in. And where this gets factored in is in zones. Let me switch over to the second tab and show you where that is. I can choose zone management. That's the easiest way to see it. I can take a look at the office and the computer lab. Let's talk about the office first. I got an occupancy for the office, and I can sort of choose some sort of different types of uh, occupancy. Is, for example, for a not so crowded office, a typical office, there's probably going to be about eight feet in that amount of square footage. I can say that there's going to be more people, or even just type in a value. Okay. I also have the issue of what they're doing in there. Okay. If they're sleeping in there, they're not really generating very much heat at all. If they're resting, it's clerical, they're typing away, that's not so much. If they're walking or dancing or exercising, they're generating heat. Okay, so you have to go ahead and kind of think about what's going on in there. Like, we generate a lot of heat in this room, even though we think of what we're doing as a clerical, okay, but our computers actually generate an awful lot of heat. For our office, I'll leave that as clerical. What I should really do is the whole issue of the computers and the light generated at them. I really should come up with a figure for how many BTUs per hour per square foot these computers are generating. I have to look that up for this number of computers. I don't have a good number like that. Computer lab, I usually just rack a little bit more active and generate. 
Okay, let me go over to the computer lab. For that one, I can say that, great, oh, there's 30 of us in here, and we won't just be doing clerical work. Uh, let's at least say where that we're, we're dancing. We're generating a little more heat in here. Okay, in terms of the thermal properties of these spaces, let's there's the issue of, are we going to put any sort of ventilation in here? And I'm going to say that, yes, we're going to have a mixed mode, that air conditioning system that's going to have sort of heating and ventilating that can come on, and, or heating and cooling that can come on and kind of deal with each other at any time. We also have the operating hours. I'll say this building, oh, let's say you're in here from 7 in the morning till hmm, recently, probably close to 11 at night. On the weekend, maybe not so bad. Okay, and I can do the same thing for the office. We'll give the office a system. We'll go up here and say they're kind of in here. Oh, not so bad. They're sort of here from 8 to 5. Weekends only in the afternoons. One final set of values I want to play around with a little bit is this whole idea of the uh, thermostat range. The thermostat range is like one of those ones, you know, people are very sensitive to this. Yeah, I'm not sure if you've ever people seen with a thermostat, because we all have different comfort ranges. I tend to like rooms warmer than others. This room gets too warm, so that's why I always wear the sweatshirt and take it off when I'm in here. But let's say we set the thermostat to, oh, like 70 degrees, okay, at the lower range. So if it got less than 70, the heat would kick on. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Now, you'll, I'm going to find out in a second, that's not a very smart thing to do, but a lot of people have the thermostat set to 70 degrees and then the heat kicks on, whatever it is. We all have some level at which we set our thermostats. I just want to show you what the impact of that is. So I'll say OK. Analysis now. OK, so we got our materials, we got our building, we got our zone. Zones. We're ready to do some computations. Mr. Farzan, what you have? Its direction sort of came from. Okay, so this is oriented to the sun properly. Orientation and times a year it's happening. Yes, give it and rev it. We can change it. But we do about it says it doesn't have a climate file in there, so let me load that. Climate files are just weather data. And they have some that are sort of built into here from different parts of the world. Let me go ahead and I'll stay in the US for now as a starting point. I'll go to New York, New York as a starting point. Then we'll move this building somewhere else in the world and I'll show you that the problem becomes very different as we move to different locations. I'll say OK. OK. We're ready to do our analysis. We had to at least give it a place to be. Under the Analysis tab, let me try this. I will say, oh, how about as a starting point, let me go to something called the, oh, it's the Passive Gains Breakdown. And let me calculate that, and we'll talk about what it's doing. What's going to happen is when I run an analysis, it's going to take all the different surfaces, kind of figure out how the sun and the temperature differences and the weather file are in there. Oh, that's the whole thing where I was worried about that one wall that's a little bit strange. I'm just going to close the error list. I should go through and fix those different objects. I knew I was going to worry about those things. Let me go back to the now. You come up with at least this far. Here's what's going on. We're in New York. You'll notice that in New York, it's indicating whether things are flowing in or flowing out of the building. In New York, what's happening is over here, the red that you see below the line is basically conduction out of the building. So that's actually the heat that's coming out through the walls, through the building. So you'll see that, oh, we're getting a lot of heat loss kind of through the walls. In the summer months, it sort of slows on down and it picks up again in the fall months. Okay. We also see that, oh, I'm losing an awful lot to ventilation. That worries me. There must be something going on where something's open because I shouldn't be getting that big a loss to ventilation. On the other side, in terms of the gains, we have some gain from direct solar. Okay, that's the yellow line coming. We 
this inside. We also have the internal loads. That's actually the gain that we're getting just from the computers that are here. That uh, kind of follows right along throughout the year. Okay. We also have something that's a little bit smaller to see in here. It's this one that's kind of this dark olive color. It's a little bit gain from what's called solar air. That's the notion that the sun hits the atmosphere. Okay. Yes, for example. Yes. Oh, it's actually it's, understand it at the level you're thinking about it that it would get it that you brought in as part of Revit. Now, so we have to sort of factor it in more in terms of those zones and. Kind of exactly. Now, it's this is a very early stage analysis tool. Yeah. Later on, in fact, we could take our data out of here to other tools like eQuest. That, that we have more flexibility of trying to incorporate like more detailed data. Okay, this one's pretty yeah, gross at a high level in terms of what's going on. Okay, so you see, we sort of have some different things in terms of heat loss and heat gain. Let me switch to a different one that'll sort of be interesting. We'll go to the direct solar gains, and I'll recalculate that one. Okay, let's talk about what's happening here. This is actually showing us watts that are being okay just by the direct solar gains, typically through that big window, something like that. You'll see that we actually have big solar gains in January, a little bit less in June and July. Okay, it could be right around the center of the day, around 12, 13, 14, so around like a noon to 2 o'clock, something like that. We don't have any gains late at night or early in the morning. What's happening here, and it's a little counterintuitive, in time, we're not actually getting these solar gains, we're getting lesser solar gains in the summertime, and let me show you why that is. The idea During the summertime, the sun's very high in the sky. So things are coming down and they're hitting the overhead. We're not actually getting the solar gain because the sun's so high in the sky that it's actually being blocked out by the shading, by the overhang. What happens during the wintertime is the sun is lower in the sky. There's just really not a marker that works in this room. Close. Okay. During the summertime, or the wintertime, the sun's much lower in the sky. When the sun shines in, it actually makes its way in and actually heats up the building that way. So that's why it's a little counterintuitive. You actually get better solar gains typically during the winter as opposed to the summer, and it's just because of the angle of the sun in the sky. Okay, let's try something else. Let me go to a different climate. Let me go back to my, uh, oh, I'll switch myself over to a different weather file. And I'll say, let's go to, oh, not the US. Let's go to Saudi Arabia. Kind of check that out. Again, I'll go back to those passive gains. I'll do my calculations. You see, in Saudi Arabia, we have a very different problem. Okay. In Saudi Arabia, the problem isn't so much that we're worried about heat flowing out of the building. We tend to actually have a lot of heat flowing into the building instead. Okay. And the point of showing your design, it's very important where the building is going to be located. That, you know, if I can propose a good green design, it's not good all over the world, it's good local to that climate. So that if you happen to be from Singapore, it's in the world where the climate is very different than California, the Northern California design may not be a very good one for what's going on there. So, maybe. Okay, let me go ahead and try showing you a different type of analysis. That is, I will switch over to resource consumption. So, sort of the whole issue of, you know, sort of, oh, the amount of energy that's coming in. Let's look at sort of the resource consumption, and I can take a look at, oh, like just the heating and cooling loads. Let me try that. Here we are in Saudi Arabia right now. You'll see that in terms of our heating and cooling, 
almost all of our load is over here on the cooling side. Okay, so we're spending almost all of our energy cooling it. I can go ahead and take a look at that, and I can look at it in terms of numeric data month by month if I want to. Okay, I can also show a cumulative graph. Let me recalculate that. Okay, I'm just using, it's, it's millions. 409 million, 457. I'm just using an awful lot of uh, energy to go ahead and cool this building right now. Okay, not nearly as much to go through and heat it. Let me go through and switch. I'm going to go back to New York again, or even San Francisco. Let me uh, load the weather file for that building or that climate instead. I'll calculate that. You'll see in New York, a lot more money, or we burn a lot more BTUs, consume a lot more energy in going through and doing the heating. Okay, so you'll see that here we're doing something, oh, we have it all the way up to, let me go through and calculate, it's 155.896, okay, and much less on the cooling. In terms of addressing this, there's a lot of things to do. I can, maybe I need in sort of more sun, Okay, so I can use the sun to go ahead and heat the building. Maybe I need to go ahead and the efficiency of the windows, so I'm not losing nearly as much energy to the windows. I can take a look at the roof and kind of try and increase the thermal values of that, so I'm not losing so much energy that way. Okay, another sort of perfectly valid strategy, because sort of, it's so easy to overlook, is we could even go through and do something like this. Remember that old thermostat thing where I had the thermostat set up to 70? Okay. It turns out, and I do this, I fight this with this battle at home all the time, because I tend to like it a little bit warmer than other folks at home. If I just go through and lower the thermostat, okay, to 68 degrees, and I say okay to that, okay, currently we're consuming, what is it? It's like uh, 155, 896. If I lower the thermostat, I get it down to 152. Doesn't seem like a lot. Well, what is it, 5 billion BTUs? That's probably significant in the scheme of things. Okay, if I lower it even further, I go, uh, you know, kind of just even greater. I can go ahead and compute this as showing the volume of CO2 if I want to. If I go through and try and put in energy costs, I could actually try and compute that in dollars and cents. So, what I want to do with this is really uh, kind of like eat for figuring out the structural loads, okay, you still have to go ahead and figure out what to do with that data in terms of how that's going to influence your design. Ecotect is a very good tool for just predicting what type of loads you're going to get thermally, what sort of energy loads, you can sort of understand what the temperature is going to be in the room, you can try and do all sorts of things. Oh, another one over here is like, uh, how about the hourly temperature or something like that? Okay, and this is 31st of December. That's kind of okay. You can see things like this where here we are, this is New York again. The outside temperature in the 31st of December tends to be around around to close to like the operating hours of like eight to 10. Okay, then it comes back down again at night. Your sort of response to that. So, awful lot of data that's available in here and it's really just all about giving you data that you can then use to go through and try to try and figure out what it is that you can do to optimize your design okay so let me break there for today we'll leave it at that point